Budget 2024 was delivered on Thursday, with the New Zealand government announcing how they plan to spend our hard-earned tax. In this video, I'll be digging into the numbers, reporting how they plan to earn and spend over the upcoming year. The left reckons they'll be cutting services, while the right reckons they'll continue to spend without restraint. Who's right? That's what I'll be digging into today. Let's get into it. This year, the government made the line-by-line -line data much more difficult to find. Previously, it was bundled up with all the usual Treasury budget reports, but this year, I had to really hunt. Finally, I found it here, hidden away in a data library webpage on a Budget 2024 government website. It's the official government data, published on the 30th of May by the New Zealand Treasury. The raw data is organized into a revenue and expenses file. Let's combine the files and get an overall view. Crunching the numbers, we get this table. At a glance, let's make one thing clear. Our government loves debt. When I did this analysis earlier, in 2018 and 19, the government spent less than it earned. Since 2020, however, the government has overspent by 15 to 30 billion each and every single year. Spending in 2018 was 86 billion dollars a year. Budget 2024 expects to spend a whopping 180 billion dollars, more than double. Even considering inflation, there has still been a 70 billion dollar increase in annual government spending with just a 55 billion increase in revenue over the same period. This treasury data, which sets out the government's income through to 2025, expects to grow income by 2.9%. This pales when compared to what we saw under Labour, when the government increased its income between 4 and 16% a year. Over on the expenses side, which Budget 2024 addresses, the government actually forecasts lower spending by a small 0.2% as compared to the previous year. This aligns with what they promised by reducing government spending Ending, which though small is still better than the 0.8 to 18.3% increases we've seen in recent years. So that's the overall view. Let's now jump into the revenue. The IRD, Customs, Ministry for the Environment, Transport and MB account for about 98% of the extra revenue the government expects to earn in 2025. The Ministry of Defence on the other hand is expected to see a 6% drop. Let's dig deeper into the detail. Despite announcing a monster tax package, adjusting the tax brackets, the government is still forecasting a 2.4% increase in PAYE in 2025. GST is set to increase 1%, though oddly, company tax is projected to increase 8.1%. On one hand, sure, Kiwi households are struggling with the cost of living, which explains why they expect to have a smaller increase in GST takings. Then why do they also expect to take much more company tax, which only arises from companies making greater profits? This to me is a bit odd. Gaming duties are also expected to increase by a whopping 16%. From the 1st of July, Overseas gambling operators will be required to pay New Zealand GST and duties on taxes earned here, which explains this increase. Areas where the inland revenue expects to earn less include withholding taxes, interest on student loans, and the pandemic small business cash flow scheme. Moving over to customs, the government expects to earn more through their charging of GST on imported goods, excise duties on tobacco and alcohol, and greenhouse gas levies. The Treasury expects to earn about the same as they did last year. Carrying the department was a half billion surplus generated by the Reserve Bank and a further $130 million capital charge to other government departments. A cause for concern here are the items that expect to generate less revenue. Interest income is expected to drop $200 million dividends from state-owned enterprises by $40 million and $220 million in repayment of loans from Kainga Order. There are large expectations on the Ministry for the Environment. The government expects an extra 20% in carbon credits and waste levies, and even larger increases from fees and royalties. As many will know, the government has made some big moves in the transport space. Road user charges are to be charged on EVs, increasing this income by 17%. Vehicle registration costs are also set to increase by $50 in the first year and $25 a year thereafter. This is expected to bring in another $70 million a year, increasing takings by 30%. They also expect to see a $100 million drop in infringement charges on our roads, and a substantial decrease in revenue from selling railway properties. Over at the Ministry of Health, there is a blanket increase in reimbursement revenue expected of 10.5%. The Ministry of Social Development expects to see a modest 3% increase in income, 
from better benefit and pension recoveries. They also expect an 8% increase in student loan repayments. One of the big surprises in the budget was the doubling of the international visitor and immigration levies. Combined, it's expected to generate an extra $180 million in annual income for MB. They're expecting a 3% drop in petrol levies as well, possibly due to the increasing electrification of the national vehicle fleet. The government is also expecting a stealthy 11% increase in electricity levies which is sure to be passed on to households and their monthly electricity bills. The remaining items are relatively small or difficult to trace back to specific announcements, so we'll skip over this. In summary, the government has kept many of their budgeted costs the same as what they had last year. While they cut their income tax takings, they've targeted a couple other areas to squeeze out more income. This includes gaming duties, carbon credits or waste levies, electricity levies, ACC, vehicle registrations and road user charges and international tourists and migrants. What did Grant Robertson tell us previously? Levies aren't a tax? I think this year, National has taken a leaf out from his book. That rounds out the revenue side of the budget. Let's now jump into the expenses. At a high level, the government expects to spend 1% more than last year on education, while increasing spending by 6% on social development, health and IRD activities. Housing and the environment will also see large increases in their budgets, up 9 and 64% respectively. Large cuts will be made to the Treasury, Transport, MB and the Defence Force budgets. Let's jump over into the data. First up is the Ministry of Social Development, which makes up about 25% of the government budget. Roughly half of this is paid as New Zealand super to all Kiwis over 65. Its budgeted cost is set to increase $1.6 billion, or 7.5% over the next year. Other safety net programs are increasing as well. Job Seeker up 9.6%, Supported Living by 5.3%, Sole Parent up 7.2%, and many others including student loans, hardship and student allowances, winter energy payments and disability assistance. Many are saying that National plans to cut these services, but the data is telling me that they're actually increasing spending in these areas by up to 21%. The only exception is the accommodation assistance, set to drop 9.7%. There are many line items here, so I'll slowly scroll through so you can pause if there are any that are of interest to you. The second largest department is the Ministry of Health, which is 16% of the government's budget. Roughly half of this is going into hospital services, with their budget going up 1.6%. Primary, community and population health services are said to receive a further 4.8% as well. There is a surprising $1.4 billion remediation in there as well to correct past issues with paying health staff their holiday pay. Something else surprising is the reduction in the budget for Pharmac, down 3.3%, which is responsible for purchasing pharmaceutical drugs for Kiwis. Given they have retracted the funding of 13 new cancer drugs and are putting the $5 co-payment back onto prescriptions, this was certainly surprising. There is also a raft of other spending, including $290 million for a new Dunedin hospital, further increases in capex for health assets, and a 6.4% increasing in funding for Hawaro Māori Health Services. On the other hand, many smaller services have been cut, such as problem gambling services, payments to the WHO, and health leadership. Third up is the Ministry of Education, which is 13% of the budget. Primary education is set to receive additional funding of 6.7%. However, secondary education providers see a 1.3% drop. Early education is to receive an extra 7.6% as well, and tertiary education a further 5.1%. There is a lot to cover here, but of note is a 3.3% decrease in funding for food and schools, a 54% drop in funding for fees-free university in line with recent changes, and learning support getting an extra 5.9%. Fourth is the inland revenue, which makes up 11% of the budget. KiwiSaver is a big cost here, with the employee and employer contributions increasing 7.9%, while the tax credits are increasing 4.1%. There are several other tax credits set to receive more funding. Family tax credits by 1.5%, in work by nearly 30%, and Nationals Family Boost Package for middle-income young families is getting 174 million bucks. Fifth is the Treasury, which is one of the big cuts in this year's budget, with funding cut by 29%. The biggest slice of funding is set aside for debt servicing, now costing over $7 billion a year, or 4% of the entire budget. That's almost the same as what it costs to run all primary and secondary schools combined. Sustained government overspending has caused this to drastically increase over recent years, with government debt effectively costing every Kiwi, both young and old, over $1,300 
a year. The government also plans to wind back New Zealand's super contributions by 45%, which was famously restarted by Labour during their term. There are many other cuts in this list, with cryptic funding names. Sixth up is the Ministry of Housing, which makes up 5% of the budget. Large savings here are made through the cutting of financing to kainga order of 50% but much of this was offset by a private debt financing facility of just under $2 billion. They've also announced a 26% increase in the budget to purchase public houses and are drastically increasing spending into various other schemes to accelerate the construction of infrastructure for housing. On the other hand, they have cut nearly 50% of the funding for the Progressive Home Ownership Fund and 56% for the First Home Grants, as was widely reported in the media. There are many items listed here, but broadly we can see the government is shaking up kainga order and investing in unlocking land for housing development. All the while, they're also scaling back some of the initiatives that help people afford the homes in the first place. The seventh department is the Ministry of Transport, making up another 5% of the budget. It should be no surprise to see at the top of the list a 7% and 30% increase in funding for the National Land Transport Package and investment in roading infrastructure. There is also another $1.4 billion set aside for the rail network and $300 million being pumped into the Auckland City Rail Link. There is a lot of money in this budget for improving the roading network, making it more resilient to all wild weather events and the trains. In eighth, we have MB, making up 4% of the budget. This department is diverse, with broad themes of increasing the productivity of New Zealand bringing money into the country and giving grants to STEM sectors that increase our export competitiveness. As you can see here, much of their budget is dedicated towards ACC services, all of which are set to increase their budgets by about 7%. To cite a few interesting examples of how their budget has changed, the New Zealand Screen Production Grants that bring Hollywood filming to the country is set to have their budget drop 19%. Public EV charger funding is also set to increase 161%. As I go down this list, you can see there has been a lot of cuts, many areas around the 30 to 50% mark. There is a lot to unpack here, especially for those close to the department, so make sure you pause if you want a closer look. Now we move on to some of the smaller departments with 3% or less of the budget. The Defence Force is set to receive 6% less funding in 2025, largely due to the $400 million decrease in the CapEx budget. Next is the Ministry for the Environment, which has seen its budget increase by 64%. This ministry is essentially paid for as they bring in $3.5 billion a year by selling units under the Emissions Trading Scheme. This makes them one of the rare ministries that actually makes money. Specific initiatives to benefit under this budget include the tyre stewardship disbursements, the Te Arawa Lakes Programme and climate resilience programs for Māori. There is also $23 million in there to find ways to reduce emissions from waste. On the police side, oddly, the crime prevention program is set to receive 1.4% less funding next year, and the road safety program, which famously aimed for zero road deaths under Labour, is being cut by 25%. There is a modest 1% increase in funding for police response teams and case investigation staff. There is also a 9.5% increase in funding for police capex into the equipment that they use. After police, we have the Department of Corrections. National, of course, campaigned hard on law and order, so it's no surprise to see a 9.1% increase in funding for prisons. Skimming through the rest of the list, I'll call out a few interesting smaller items. There is a new $350 million committed through the Ministry of Justice this for treaty settlements through to 2028. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs has also cut their international aid to the Pacific in developing countries by 9.1%. There has also been an 85% cut in funding for the New Zealand Antarctic Institute. Oranga Tamariki, or the Ministry for Children, has had almost everything they do slashed. The Ministry for Primary Industries has received over $20 million to recover from Cyclone Gabriel. They've also cut 95% of funding to primary sector international organisations. The Department of Internal Affairs has seen an $8 million investment in iwi involvement in water services reform, likely in response to shutting down three waters. Nearly $1.3 million is set aside for upgrading official residences, likely Premier House where the Prime Minister is supposed to live. A million dollars is also designated for the Pike River Memorial for the perished miners a few years back. Scrolling down a bit, there's something interesting in the works down at the parliamentary service. Around $100 million is set aside over the next year to develop a future accommodation service. Know what that is? Fancy new accommodation for MPs to live on parliamentary grounds, 
Good for them, eh? If you want to take a closer look at the raw files I've used in today's video, I've included a link down below in the video description. I'll also include a link to my Google Sheet breakdown. If you're new to the channel, I make a lot of content in the personal finance and investing space. Please make sure to subscribe down below as it supports me to make more content just like this. Thanks for watching and I look forward to catching you on the next one. Cheers.